Okay, let's talk about 2 Peter and Jude. Let's start off with some shout outs here. Jacob, Holly, hope you guys are doing okay. Um, Juan, Emmy, hi, how are you guys doing? Hope you guys are continuing to do well. Here we have our key concepts as usual. And let's start with some background. We're gonna start with the book of Jude. Now, 2 Peter and Jude are in the same PowerPoint because there's a close relationship between the two of them. And we'll, we'll explain that probably when we get to 2 Peter, but that'll help you guys understand why we're starting with Jude, even though we did 1 Peter last time. So briefly here, who's the author? Please don't get Jude confused with Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is the guy who killed, Je who betrayed Jesus, leading to him getting killed. Jude is the brother of Jesus. Um, now, sometimes brothers betray their betray each other, but that 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 doesn't seem to be the case in in, in this particular instance. Um, Jude is oftentimes presumed to be a pseudonymous work of literature. Once again, as has been the case with many of our um, general epistles that we've looked at. Uh, the reason for this has to do with the belief in the predictions of the apostles. He is writing, uh, Jude writes about the predictions of the apostles as though they are long since dead, which would imply that they, uh, the, the book is written uh, fairly late in the first century after these people have come and gone. And if Jude is a brother of Jesus, then presumably he would have come and gone as well. Um, the point of the book of Jude has always perplexed scholars because it is so vague. It has such a general concept and approach to it. We really are not sure um, who it's addressed to um, or even what its specific situation is. And so what we think is Jude was meant to be a template for future generations for how they should deal with false teaching. And it doesn't give us any specifics on what kind of false teaching. It just serves as an outline or a template for how future generations should deal with the problem of false teaching. And one of our reasons for thinking of that is there's simply put very little detail about what the false teaching is that Jude is trying to combat. So let's get a little bit of, let's go through the content of this extremely short letter here. And basically what he's going to say is that God will defeat the evil teaching. How does he know this? Now this is one of the two interesting points about the book of Jude that I want you to pay attention to. The way he knows that God will defeat the evil teaching has to do with the fact he quotes from the book of Enoch. Later on, he's going to quote from something called the Assumption of Moses. These are books that are part of Jewish heritage and tradition. They are not in the Old Testament. They are not in anybody's version of the Old Testament. And so Jude, this is something you'll want to know for the test. Jude surprisingly uses non-biblical sources or non-canonical sources to prove that God will defeat evil teaching. So the big takeaway here is know that God use know that Jude uses non-biblical sources. Now, um, his conclusion is that the False teachings are a sign of the end times. I don't think we're meant to take this literally as the world is literally ending because there have been a lot of false teachers over the years. Um, and if that's the case, the world should have ended by now. I think what he is saying somewhat hyperbolically or somewhat symbolically is that ungodly or false or unjust teachers are something to be taken as seriously as the end times. Um, and so don't, uh, don't give in to their teachings. Here's the second point, though, that I really want you to be aware of from the book of Jude. And I, th I think it's important 
in light of what we've looked at in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, we found out that it's very dangerous to commit apostasy, to give up on your faith. And I think that's, I, I, I still think that's true. But Jude reminds us that we are to pray for those who are doubting. He does not condemn those who are doubting. He instead encourages us to pray for them. They are not beyond hope. And I think what Jude is suggesting to us here is that doubt is not the worst possible thing. Doubt is a natural part of faith that everybody goes through. It's okay to have times, not just moments, but times of doubt. Now, I, I don't think Jude wants you to stay there. I don't want you to stay there if you're experiencing a period of doubt. Um, but just because you wake up one morning and you say, God, I'm just, I'm just not so certain about this whole Christianity thing, that's not the same thing as committing apostasy. That's you reevaluating your faith, and that's consistent with what Jude is saying. Jude is saying that's okay, that's appropriate. All right, that's all there is to the book of Jude. It's a short letter, so I can cover that in a whopping six minutes. That's probably more than I needed to spend with it. So let's move on to 2 Peter now. As has been the case, 2 Peter seems to be pseudonymous, largely for the same reasons or similar reasons as 1 Peter is believed to be pseudonymous. Now, what I think is worth noting here is that 2 Peter is, if it is pseudonymous, we believe it's the last book of the New Testament to be written, probably written around the year 120 AD. I think that's a fun fact that all New Testament students should know. I want you to know the first letter to be written is probably 1 Thessalonians, and now we get to know what is probably the last book of the New Testament to be written, and that is 2 Peter. So you'll want to know that for the test. Now, what's the purpose of 2 Peter? It's to prove that Jesus is coming again, and this makes an awful lot of sense. If this book is, in fact, written in the year 120 AD, that means that, means that as many as two, three, depending on how long people were living back then, maybe even four generations of Christians have come and gone. Four is probably a little bit high. Probably two to three generations of Christians have come and gone. And Paul, when he writes 1 Thessalonians, is emphasizing this idea of Jesus is coming back very soon. And so that leads to this expectation that people think he's going to show up in your lifetime. Now, everybody's definition of soon is different, but within your lifetime is a reasonable definition of soon. And so we think that 2 Peter is written to deal with a sense of disappointment amongst early Christians that Jesus has not yet come back. And so 2 Peter is written to prove and remind people Jesus is definitely going to come back. So the way he does this is he emphasizes that he is Peter and therefore he has seen things. He is somebody who is trustworthy. You need to trust him and not other people. We should not trust false teachers. They haven't seen Jesus. They don't know what they're talking about, but Peter does. And so to prove that we should not trust these false teachers, 2 Peter is going to copy 19 of the 25 verses of the book of Jude. I would like you to know the relationship between 2 Peter and Jude. I want you to know this for the test. 2 Peter copied Jude, not the other way around. Don't get them mixed up. 2 Peter copied Jude. And so what we think is going on is 2 Peter used Jude in the way that Jude wanted to be used. Jude is being used as a template for how to deal with false teachings, and 2 Peter is picking up on that, copies from Jude, and uses that as a basis for proving that we shouldn't listen to false teachers who say Jesus isn't coming back. 
So now we get to the main point of what Peter wants to talk about. He is going to prove that the second coming of Jesus is still happening. Um, let's skip on down to the last of the of the major bullet points, because this is going to establish for because this is where um, looking at this will tell us uh, the major reasons why Peter is confident that the second coming will still happen. Um, first. God's time is different than our own. A thousand years is like a day to God, and a day is like a thousand years to God. He's quoting from Psalm 90, verse 4, to make his point. And so what he is saying here is that our definition of soon is that something should happen in our lifetime. But from God's point of view, soon does not have to be within our lifetime. Soon to God could be millions of years in the future for us. Um, so the first reason why Peter says that we should still trust that Jesus is coming back is God's time is different than our own. The second reason why we should trust Peter that Jesus is coming back is that God is intentionally waiting to send Jesus back into the world because he is allowing time for repentance. Nevertheless, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. It will be sudden, but it may not happen as soon as we all expect it to. So, if you're hoping that Jesus will bail you out and prevent and you will not need to study for your final exams by coming back, that could happen. But probably not based on 2 Peter, because God's time is different than our own. All right. Uh, that one was short, sweet, and to the point, hopefully. Um, if you have any questions, as always, email me. Um, hope you all are continuing to do well. Talk at you next time.